uh, the last talk before people go skiing or go sleeping or go eating is uh, Sean uh, Whalen. And I've not been reading titles, so I'm not going to start now. Sure, yeah. So this is structural improvisation using automated pattern discovery. Um, I'm actually a, a researcher in computer security, so uh, so if you take umbrage with any of my definitions, please take it a little bit easy on me. Um, so, so my claim is that essentially the remix is pervasive in, in modern culture, and so my kind of loose definition of a remix is that we have some existing material and we subtract, add, or adjust it until something novel emerges. And so the person doing the remixing plays a lot of different roles. They kind of act as a sculptor or a curator, an engineer, and, and many others I'm sure we could think of. So what if the remixer was actually the song itself? And that's kind of the semi-philosophical question I wanted to explore here. So uh, a really informal evolution of these ideas uh, can be traced with the remix, can be traced back to Dadaism and, and Tristan Lazar, who generated these random poems from kind of a bag of words. And that was uh, a big influence for William S. Burroughs and his literary cut-ups when he would take pre-existing texts and chop them up into words or sentences and then rearrange them to make uh, novel stories. And of course, uh, the pervasive phenomena of the remix in modern pop music is hip hop and sampling, and taking that one step further into mashups. So, artists like Danger Mouse, who is the gray album where you have uh, backing sounds from the Beatles' White Album and vocals from Jay Z's Black Album, or an artist like Girl Talk, who's very comfortable uh, mashing up the vocals of James Taylor with uh, Dirty South rap lyrics. So the idea here is that there's this uh, <laughs> spectrum of, of structure. So we have, uh, you know, random pieces like Burroughs cut-ups or some of Stockhausen's pieces. Then we have, you know, some intentionally often more predictable uh, techno, not a slam on techno. Um, and then maybe in the extreme case, the most predictable music might be an example would be Cage's 433. <laughs> <laughs> So obviously there's a spectrum of between you know totally random music and totally predictable music. And so that's kind of what I wanted to explore in this, is this, this spectrum in between. So there's this interplay between you know, structure and order and chaos. And so one way I sometimes think about music is this perceptual information channel, kind of a Shannon information channel, from the creator to the consumer. And so outside of kind of philosophical uh, points, to most people, both of those extremes become interesting. If we're just listening to the same note over and over and over, uh, ad infinitum, or you know, we're listening to something totally chaotic that we cannot hope to predict, to most people those extremes aren't super interesting. So, and recent research has started to measure that this balance of familiar, familiarity and surprise uh, kind of maximizes people's appreciation. So this has a lot to do with how complex is the song. And so, so there's two components to this. There's how random is the signal. So random meaning you know unpredictable. Uh, you know concepts of surprise and anticipation, our expectations and those expectations being violated. <coughs> and also how structured is the source. So if we think of a song, in a sense, is a kind of stochastic process. What is the internal structure needed to express the randomness in that signal that it produces? And so there's dozens and dozens of <laughs> different definitions of complexity. So I'll just go over uh, two here. So there's the KC complexity, which is also known as sometimes is the deterministic complexity of a string S. is the length of the shortest universal Turing machine program that produces S. So in this notion of complexity, we're kind of associating randomness with complexity. So if we have a, a uniform random bit string, we can't really compress that. Anymore. So the, the shortest universal Turing machine program is essentially going to have to store that string to explicitly reproduce it. And so in that sense, it's associating randomness with complexity. So there's this alternate notion of statistical complexity. So if we want to give up our need to exactly reproduce the string, we can produce a new string with the same statistics. 
And so in that sense, we're instead associating with structure with complexity. So here, where we have a uniform random stream, in this sense, with high complexity, here it's going to have low complexity, because we can essentially have uh, a single state machine model with probabilistic transitions, which basically models a coin being flipped, and that's essentially the same complexity as a totally periodic model. Okay, so what I think is interesting about this notion of complexity is it kind of captures this, this notion that I was talking about, that between these two extremes, there's this structure, and that leads to often to more enjoyment. So obviously this is contingent uh, on kind of exploring these ideas and how do we actually measure complexity. So one way of measuring the complexity of a signal is Shannon's entropy rate. And one way that's often approximated is by the lempel zib algorithm, so implemented by something like GZIP. And there's uh, lots of people who argue that that's not really a good approximation. Uh, but that's maybe back at a different time. Um, but also the complexity of the source. So again, if we think of the source um, that generates these, these nodes as some sort of st stochastic process, what's the complexity needed to produce information at a particular entropy rate? So the model that we're using is this uh, minimal causal representation from stati statistical physics called an epsilon machine. And that can uh, directly calculate the entropy rate uh, H mu and the statistical SDC. <coughs> and so this is what we're referring to in the title with automated pattern discovery. So just to kind of uh, unabstract it from its uh, kind of statistical physics usage, it, it'll be more familiar to people in machine learning as basically a special kind of hidden Markov model with uh, an edge emitting hidden Markov model with deterministic transitions. And we have special states called causal states, which are equivalence classes of histories with the same next symbol prediction. And the number of states in the HMM is inferred directly from the data instead of having to specify the topology of the model beforehand. And so these are, in the limit of infinite data, uh, the claim for epsilon machines is that they're the minimally sized optimally predictive model of the stationary stochastic process. So, uh, here's two really simple epsilon machines. So this is a period two process. We have two states, and here we have uh, labels on the transitions. So on the right-hand side of the label is the uh, symbol that's being emitted, so zero and one. And on the left-hand side is the probability of that transition being taken. So here we just bounce back and forth and generate zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Here's a slightly more involved epsilon machine where um, basically we're producing binary strings where there's a, a restriction that no two consecutive zeros can appear. So at this state, we basically have a coin flip. We can produce a one or a zero with some bias. But if we do produce a zero, we're in state B, and we have to follow that up with a one. Okay, so that's another simple epsilon machine. And of course, they can be more involved, um, and, and they'll get much hairier than that in reality. So um, we're kind of exploring these trade-offs with this very simple algorithm that we're calling auto-remix. So uh, the idea, again, is that we allow some to remix itself at various levels of granularity. So in, in this work, we focus on beats. And so the idea is that we essentially have some waveform, we run a beat detection algorithm on it, and we cluster similar beats together we'll have a time series of cluster IDs, and we'll infer this epsilon machine from the time series of cluster IDs. And then we can use the epsilon machine to generate a new time series via a random walk on the epsilon machine. And so essentially we're treating the song as a stochastic process, and the clustering allows us to adjust the amount of entropy in the model. So I kind of went over this already, but this is just a really simple example. So we have our waveform. We run a beat detection algorithm on it and say we have some sample with four different beats in it. And we'll run some clustering, so say just standard k-means. And we'll group these first two beats into one cluster and the second two beats into a different cluster. And then we'll infer an epsilon machine from that. And we'll do a random walk on the epsilon machine and we'll uh, sample from this first cluster. And we can see we end up with four beats again 
we're sampling from this first cluster, we can either pick beats one or two for that, and this time we chose a two. Here we have cluster ID one, we can sample either of those two beats, and this time we chose a one, and so on. So we, we get kind of a shuffled version of the, the beats and so on. So, uh, kind of the, the limiting cases are we can choose the, the same number of clusters as there are beats in the song. And so every beat gets assigned to its own cluster. And as we decrease the number of clusters, then some beats are going to be forced into clusters with other beats. And so we're going to be able to increase the randomness of the output. And so you can see as we back off the number of clusters, uh, the number of distortion, or the amount of distortion per cluster goes up. So, uh, so we can also look at kind of the space of these epsilon machines according to the, the entropy rate and the statistical complexity. Um, and so, so this is uh, a figure from a different piece of work, but the idea is that we could actually run this kind of analysis and, and look at, say, where you know, a piece by Bach might be, or a piece by Beethoven might be, or we can also look at how, where the machines for a particular, the same song vary as we change these different uh, number of clusters or inference parameters. And so they might diffuse locally around these kind of semi-stable subspaces. So just to kind of summarize, the idea is to treat a song as a stochastic process and allowing a song to remix itself through this automated pattern discovery a technique based on epsilon machines. And so the goal is to explore the trade-offs between structure and randomness in the signal and the source. And uh, we think maybe there, there might be some applications with this to quantify the perception of these trade-offs using information theory. So uh, just to give a little more detail, um, all this was done in, in Python and we used the Echonest Remix SDK for the beat detection. Um, for the features for clustering, we initially started off using FFT coefficients uh, and also tried wavelets, but we ended up getting the best audible results using MFCCs, using the YAFE library. Uh, for clustering, we started off using the initial, just a simple k-means algorithm implemented in SciPy, and uh, we also tried affinity propagation and k-means plus plus in the scikits.learn package and, and ended up using k-means plus plus. And to infer epsilon machines, we use the computational mechanics of the Python library. So I actually have um, kind of a, a sample of a song here that was remixed uh, using this technique. And so I chose the number of clusters to be half the number of beats. So roughly half the beats are going to be forced to be stuffed into a cluster with another beat. So when we take a random walk on the model, we're going to get some randomness. And because it's hard to kind of, um, especially with a piece of music that you don't know, I kind of unrolled the epsilon machine to preserve the temporal structure of the song. And so what you're mostly going to be hearing here is a lot of the order preserved, but you can hear the effect of the cluster. And so it shouldn't sound too jarring, but once in a while you'll hear a sound that is a little, you'll pro hopefully be able to tell where those things occur. <laughs> So... 